Hi everybody and welcome to the Rebel Wisdom Podcast. So it's about a month since we did the last podcast. It's been a really busy month, a uh, lot of content, new content coming up on the channel. Um, and there's been a kind of common theme emerging, uh, which is the shadow. It's what we're going to talk about today. We did this, the interview with uh, Zen Master, talking about Jordan Peterson in the shadow, which has had like been really successful. It's had about 80,000 views and loads of comments, but really polarized. People either seem to love it or hate it, which is fantastic. Um, it's a really interesting phenomena in itself. And we did a whole series of films about Jordan Peterson and the left. And the kind of subtitle of that, or the, the subtext of that was pretty much the shadow of the left. What is the left not seeing about itself? What is it not integrating uh, to move forward? And what does it need to do to recover and be a healthy part of the political dialogue? Which is another really important part of, um, yeah, that, that's kind of how, what the shadow looks like on a wider cultural level. And I guess the Zen monk is like the personal shadow. So we'll go into that. And we're also going to go through some of the content we've got coming up. There's some stuff that I'm really excited about that we're going to be starting to put up next week. And we've already put up quite a few extra interviews on mostly for patrons. So if you're supporting us on Patreon, great. Uh, you can go to our Patreon site and uh, already view that. If not, please do consider supporting us because uh, then you'll get access to all of this great material and also help us make more of the, the films that hopefully you enjoy if you're watching this. I'm assuming you enjoy them. Um, and we've also got a live event in London on the 18th of September that we're calling The Great Awakening. Um, I guess we've got a few sort of new subscribers, so maybe you're not familiar with, with the kind of the theme of this channel, but we're looking at the Jordan Peterson phenomena, we're looking at the intellectual dark web phenomena, and the internet as a whole as unlocking this great intellectual awakening online. And we're going to be taking that out into the real world in September, the 18th of September, in Brick Lane in London, and we're going to put the details of that below the video here. Yeah, so talking about uh, Jordan Peterson and the intellectual dark web, I think um, a lot of the response and a lot of the impetus for people really connecting with that is because these conversations are pointing out shadows in our culture. So they're pointing out the shadow of progressive culture, the shadow of the left um, in particular, because a big aspect of shadow work, um, which a few people have also asked us about, is that when we have a shadow basically is any part of yourself that you reject and cut off from the rest of yourself. So for example, if, if I said to myself, I'm not an angry person, every time I had a natural anger response, I would kind of suppress it and you put it down into the basement of your psyche and then, uh, but you don't get rid of it because you can't because it's you. So you start projecting it out into the world and then it looks like everyone else is angry. And you're wondering, well, why is everyone always so angry? I'm never angry, I'm better than that. Um, and so you're actually seeing a mirror of yourself through other people, um, and, but you're still acting angry. You'd be, in that case, probably passive aggressive. So that really, um, that is happening on a cultural level. There's a kind of hypocrisy within the culture of not owning, for example, progressive culture not being as progressive or tolerant as it claims to be, I think was a big part of the impetus for a lot of the conversations that are happening now. Um, and it, it, yeah. it's, it has a hidden tribalism, that yeah. it has a hidden, it is as bigoted in some ways as the things that it's protesting against. Exactly. For yeah. And, and it's the same from the individual level. It's this, you know, this person, the, the person I was just describing who suppressed their anger, they are just as angry as the angriest person. They just haven't owned it. And so part of, part of shadow work is going, uh, Doshin talked about this briefly uh, with us as, and we use this in our workshop, there's a method called three, two, one, which works really well. So first it's an it, it's the three. It's like, it's not me, it's out there. Then it's the two, so you have a dialogue with it. So you kind of communicate with an aspect of yourself in a way that's kind of dissociated from you. And then the last stage is becoming it. And that, this, that, that's, I think, the stage that scares people both individually and collectively is that, oh, but if I, if I accept the fact that I'm angry, what's to stop me going out and murdering loads of people? And of course, that's not what happens. When, when you integrate the shadow, you become more whole and it's a very specific feeling of being more psychologically whole, but also having more self-respect. You know, Peterson talks about that um, actually in the interview, in Truth and Time of Chaos, it's um, you kind of, you own your potential for havoc. And you, like a martial artist, you have 
control of yourself. It's not leaking out sideways to everyone. It's, it's within you. And on an individual level, it's totally crucial, but also on the collective level as well. Yeah, it's kind of that level of integration that I think, again, he said in that interview, if you, it's either under your control or it has you. You have it or it has you. Those are the options. Yeah, the question is kind of how do you find the shadow as well? And in your life, it's someone that you have a reaction that's out of proportion to the this stimulus by that person. And it's someone who's just like, oh, I cannot stand that person for whatever reason. It's usually a good sign that, oh, yeah, there's a part of me that I'm not owning in that. And which brings us quite nicely onto the fact that the Doshin interview <laughs> was about the shadow and created some of the most polarizing reactions that I think I've ever seen from an interview. It's kind of equally split. And I have private messages from people as well. Some people saying, that's the best interview you've ever done. It's, it's amazing, he's so profound. And other ones saying, I felt physically ill when I watched him. <laughs> yeah. And this is, this is wonderful in, in a way. It's really fascinating to see that this one interview could create such different responses. And then if you looked at the comments, it was exactly the same. He's a fraud, he's a charlatan, together with, he's like the Dalai Lama. It's like, this is, this is really fascinating. Um, and I would also hope that as we kind of move forward, what we're hoping to do is to create a kind of dialogue that moves beyond just those reactions, that incorporates those reactions. Like they, they're, they're, they're useful, they're valuable, valuable information to know this is how I felt when I saw this. And maybe those reactions were right. Maybe he is a fraud. I don't know. I spent a few hours with him. I liked him. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated as to what's, um, what's behind these reactions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, can we get to a place where we can acknowledge those reactions and then hold them a bit lightly and say, this is how I felt when I saw this, but maybe it's saying something about me as much as it's saying something about that other person. And Obviously, a YouTube comment section is pretty much the shadow in, in, um, in internet form. And we, we get sucked into this very binary kind of way of looking at the world. Do we like this? Do we not like this? Is this right? Is this wrong? And I guess we're trying to kind of encourage a, a form of dialogue and a way of looking at the world that goes a little bit beyond that and says, there is this, this is the reaction I had, but there's some value in it as well. And because I think even, yeah, that whatever you thought of that interview, I think there's some gold in there. There's some real gold uh, in, in what he was saying. And I know that you know quite a bit more than I do about Zen and what, how kind of ironic it is that this, this created the reaction that it did. Yeah, it's kind of perfect in some ways um, because, so Doshin comes from Rinzai Zen, which is quite a kind of challenging form of Zen. It's like Samurai Zen. Um, it's the hardcore form that uses koans. So koans are like these um, little, uh, logic bombs basically like there's no such thing as time so what is memory and the teacher would give that to the student or what was your original face before you were born yes yeah or or like in the end of the interview what is the sound of one hand clapping it's this by the way <laughs> yeah we that one we solved so there's only like a hundred more koans to go uh, yeah and the point of a koan is basically to destroy the ego's capacity to make sense instead you fall you, you surrender. So much of Zen is about letting go. Um, there's a lovely phrase, I think from Dogen, who was a Zen master called, um, Zen is like opening the hand of thought. So you're grasping and it relates to the shadow because you're grasping onto identity. For example, in that anger example, it's like identity is not an angry person. So you're grasping onto that. And through practice, you learn how to open it up. And then you realize that there was nothing you were holding onto. So I always describe it as um, letting go of holding on. So how that relates to something like the Doshin interview is that A, I think it's, it's great because it kind of doesn't matter whether Doshin is like some kind of mystic or a total fraud. Uh, if you're looking at it in terms of what can I learn about my own reaction to this? How can I, you know, using it as a mirror in a sense. Um, and also it's, it's great because people in Rinzai Zen, they tend to challenge. So like a koan is like a total, it's a challenge. And in a lot of the Zen stories, they would give a koan and the student goes off for like, it's very Japanese, so it's like absurd amounts of time. It's like six months, they're sitting on a mountain being like, whoa, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And they come back to the master and they have this whole like philosophical thing. And the master's like, no, you're wrong, fuck off. And they're like, okay, I'm gonna get it. And they go back for another three years and then eventually like they're like 
50 years old and the master's like old and gray and they're like, okay, they give one more answer and the master's like, no, nah, you're wrong, go away, you're wasting my time. And then eventually they're like, oh God, I give up. And then they're like, yes, you got it. And that's, you know, it's a tricky, it's a trickster's, um, he describes himself as a troublemaker, actually, Doshin. It is a troublemaker, trickster form of Zen. So in a way, I'm kind of surprised by the reaction, but also I'm not, um, I'm not that surprised in retrospect if I think about that tradition of Zen, yeah. So in a way, I guess it's that he's not there to make you feel comfortable. Yeah. Quite the opposite. Yeah. And the fact that so many people felt uncomfortable watching it is actually quite fascinating. And, and also, as you said, I don't know whether they're right or the other people are right. I don't know which side is right, even having spent time with him. Still don't know. Um, and yeah, the, the kind of, yeah, that's another thing of Zen. You know, there's a lot, there's a, there's a really famous Zen phrase of if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. You know, it's, it's not about another person telling you how to live your life. It's about you finding, it's kind of a Gnostic thing. You, you find the wisdom within yourself, this kind of special knowledge that is all experiential. And there's a lot of inner sovereignty that comes with that. It's interesting you just mentioned Gnosticism because we also put out an interview with Tim Freak uh, just a few days ago, which, yeah, I found really interesting. I really liked his framing of the Christian story and the pagan story as being connected rather than being being in opposition to each other. Yeah, it's also been a little bit polarizing, that interview um, between, I guess, literalist interpretations of the Bible and the more Gnostic interpretations, which are more based around um, kind of what I was talking about a moment ago, of direct experience of the divine. Um, not that that doesn't exist in Christianity, but I would say that in lots of forms of modern Christianity, the practices used don't create mystical experiences. Like taking communion doesn't give you a, it's not like taking acid, for example. It's a really different experience. Um, so yeah, it's, it's also an interesting debate and a little bit like the science and Christianity debate. It's not one that I think is easily solved, but it again is an opportunity for a kind of generative discussion, if people want to have it, around, um, around their beliefs, I guess. And before that, we also put out the, the whole series about Jordan Peterson and the left, which was kind of subtitled The Shadow of the Left. Mm -hmm. And my, my friend, Andrew Sweeney, who I'm hoping to catch up with again soon, he's done quite a few pieces for us and mm -hmm. uh, writes quite a lot about the Jordan Peterson phenomena online. And he, he made this really interesting connection which is to the archetypal. Jordan Peterson talks about the archetypal quite a lot. And he, he, he drew the link between, so on, on the right, we have the tyrannical father. Like the danger of the right is the tyrannical father. The, uh, but the danger on the left is the kind of the archetype of the devouring mother. It's the caring uh, instinct that then goes too far and ends up stopping the development of our own children. So does not allow, is so interested in taking care of, of, of people that it doesn't allow people to actually develop. And I thought it was a really interesting yeah. archetypal framework to look at it, because that ultimately is, I think, the shadow of the left. Yeah, and I wonder if, if even that archetype contains a shadow within it. It's like the, for me, the devouring mother has a sense of, well, why, why is an archetype dark or why is it unresolved? Like in literature, it's usually because there is some um, ego issue with that character. Th that's why they're the bad guy. Like Macbeth has a um, lust for power and that's his uh, fatal flaw. They, they all have a fatal flaw. And I wonder if in a way the, the fatal flaw within that devouring mother archetype is that it's trying to resolve its own issues through the outside. It's like if I care, if I mother and care so much, then I will be whole in some way. There's, for me, there feels like there is a projection in that as well. And it's something I notice some often in uh, what people would call, I guess, the regressive left. It's like, like I, I care deeply about other people and I'm so, I'm so passionate and I'm so compassionate, but actually that compassion comes with a weird um, edge or there's something required for it. It's not given freely and lovingly. It's, it's got a kind of edge to it. It's also a kind of tribal compassion yeah, yeah. because it assumes that other people don't have compassion. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you look at sort of politics a bit more open-mindedly, you see that 
often there's no sort of division between the amount of compassion that's felt. Like on the right, compassion is generally focused mostly on the family and then the, the immediate community and the nation state. Whereas on the left, it's sort of more universal compassion. And I think it's wrong to see any one of those as more advanced than any other, because I think the, the mistake on the left is to assume that, that it, it, it confuses rights and responsibilities, because we, we, may have, we may all have universal human rights and all be deserving of, of love and respect, and it, it doesn't necessarily follow that we have equal responsibilities to everybody and that responsibilities in any practical sense can only ripple out from our immediate communities into the, into the wider world. And I don't think my mum is the best mum in the world because I think she's superior to all other people. But I think that because she's my mum and that's the relationship I have with my mum and everyone should feel like that about their mum. I think there's a real category error on the left when those things get confused. And that's where we start getting into what I think are fairly crazy ideas like we should do away with borders, why the fact that I was born in some place should I have more rights to, to stuff than, than other people. And then suddenly you're into this very swamp-like place where there is no meaning, there is no meaningful attachment to place, there is no meaningful attachment to a personal lived experience of being in a certain place. And, and suddenly you're in, yeah, that, that's where I think the left yeah. starts to go too far. And I think the, 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 sh the shadow of tribalism on the left, saying we're not tribal, but we're really tribal, I think it, it gets projected into the ideology rather than the traditional tribal matrix, which would be the, the family expanding out to the tribe. And then I guess at some point it was the nation state, but yeah. So but it's the ideology and the tribe at the same time. Yeah. Because they create an unacknowledged tribe. Yes. The left creates a tribe of people who think like us yeah. that they then refuse to admit is actually a tribe. But mm -hmm. you know, if you've ever been in those environments, if you start saying things that don't fit with, the, with that worldview, you will find yourself excluded. It's policed by language. I mean, really, really carefully policed, but there's almost like a language, a linguistic code to it, I think, it's, which is where that idea of uh, virtue signaling comes from, which I think people on, on in, well, I don't know, saying on the left is a bit misleading, but let's say in that, in that kind of environment, people who aren't fully owning their shadow, I think it really uh, triggered by the phrase virtue signaling. It seems to be one of the things that really gets in there. And just to return to kind of finish off the, the shadow mm. idea, is that Doshin and quite a lot of the other kind of people we've spoken to talk about shadow work as being the essential work for getting us out of the current postmodern mess. Because the only way to get out is for people to recognise that they are the thing that they're protesting against. Yeah. That they are projecting out onto the world exactly the thing that they think that they're fighting against. The tribalism, the judgmentalism, the bigotry. All of those things are, in some sense, hardwired, but also can only be transcended and included once they've been acknowledged. Yeah, that's a question of humility for humans, to, like for people to have humility and, and get away from this idea of like, I'm the good guy and they're the bad guys. You know, Carl Jung said um, when, when people, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but when people really get down into the shadow, they realize I'm not as good a person as I thought I was. And it's just like that simple. It's like Doshin said, you have to feel really fucking uncomfortable. That's when you know you're really um, on your edge and looking at an aspect of yourself that is so difficult. It's not easy to, to own the shadow by definition. If it was easy, just do it like that. It can, take, it can take years, even after identifying it, to make that leap in the three to one method, to make that leap to be like, oh, this is me. But um, it's, yeah, I agree with, I agree with that, what, what he was saying. It's, it's what needs to happen everywhere, I think. So we've had a few people get in touch asking for practical tips on integrating the shadow. And I think your, the idea of the three, two, one meditation is a really good one. So look at something that triggers you in the outside world, then effectively realize that, yeah, that's me. Yeah, and we also run workshops for men and women, uh, and shadow work is a huge part of both of them. So for details on those, check uh, on our website, and we'll put the details in the show notes below. And we've also got some really interesting content now up on Patreon. It's taken us a little while after coming back from America to kind of edit it and get it up, but we have 
a really interesting discussion between Jordan Greenhall and Akira the Don. Akira the Don, who people might know from JBP Wave, and Jordan Greenhall, who was in the Glitch in the Matrix film and is one of the most, yeah, really fascinating thinkers. I'll play a clip of that now. All right, so what's happening is that people are perceiving, because it's becoming increasingly obvious, that all of these artifacts of the way that we've gone about doing civilization in all the different ways, like pick your poison, it doesn't really matter, because they're all kind of tied together, yeah. um, are breaking down and failing in a way that is no longer easy to pretend isn't happening. And so as a consequence, this triggers a deep visceral sense. And that's a good thing, right? Because that deep visceral sense is the return to the liminal, the return to the mystery, the return to the, the state, which by the way invokes this conversation. Right? Human beings have encountered this problem before. Which is an, in kind of an, an imperative for us to transcend to the level we need to get to, to become the species that we could be. You need those kind of stakes mm -hmm. to force you mm. oh, I like that. in that direction. And another new film called Understanding the Intellectual Dark Web with the two philosophers from the CIIS. We're entering, just entering into the underworld and it's a descent Right, it's mm -hmm. the it's the mythic descent into the underworld. It's the dissolution. It's we're feeling everything starting to shake and and buckle, and it's like fractally all these lines of, of division. It's like the center cannot hold. And another few films up there, including the behind the scenes with Jordan Peterson from our interview with him last year. And um, would you like some tea? So yeah, we're starting to do a kind of twin track of content. We'll keep releasing stuff on the main YouTube channel but we're going to increasingly put up um, early content or exclusive content for patrons. So if you enjoy the content and you want to help support it, please do, and you'll get access to all of this patron-only content as well. Yeah, and also if anyone wants to join the conversation, uh, the wider conversation, we have a pretty thriving Discord uh, chat going. Um, we'll put the link to it under here. There's also now patron-only Discord. Uh, to discuss the content that's up there on Patreon, but then also to ask questions for the Q&A. Um, but either way, I think join the Discord if you want to kind of uh, have a really engaging discussion. It's, uh, yeah, it is constantly interesting. And lots of announcements this week. We have our first live event to talk about a lot of the ideas that we've raised in our films in London on the 18th of September. Um, again, we'll put the details for it below the video in the show notes. And yeah, do come along if you're in London. Um, don't fly over for it, it's probably not gonna be that good. Well, but... do fly over for it, it's okay, gonna be worth do it. Do fly over yeah. for it if you're in America, <laughs> it's gonna be that good. And yeah, see you soon.